Hi, and welcome back to Allen High School's discussion of reactions at the AP IBHL level. We're going to forge ahead here and start discussing. This will take two videos to discuss single replacement reactions. Single replacement are similar to double replacement, but they have a few distinguishing characteristics that will help you recognize those. One of the key is that, yes, they have two reactants so there's two reactants going to two products but the difference is, is one of them is going to be an element so you're going to have an element plus a compound an element plus water an element plus acid these are always a redox because whenever you take an element oxidation number of zero and react it so that it goes to form a compound, it's always going to have a, well, there's a few exceptions with carbon that we won't come across, but we're always going to be seeing ones with a non-zero oxidation number. So these are always a redox. There's four different types metals plus ionic, active metal plus water, active metal plus acid, and a halogen plus an ionic halide. Now, what this is like is, okay, here's Denzel, and here is me and my husband, and Denzel is going to kick my husband out, and my poor husband would be by himself, and he's going to dance with me. Ms. Marusik says it's like get a new girlfriend, kick your old one to the curb, or get a new boyfriend and kick your old one to the curb. So uh, it's not a swap per se, because somebody always ends up all alone there. My poor husband. Fortunately, he is fully aware of my obsession with Denzel. All right. Now, just a, a few reminders that we want to keep in mind. I'm going to talk about this one in more detail. Uh, don't forget your diatomics. That's going to be critical because we're going to be dealing with halogens here. Uh, metals, we have to be careful with some of our metals, our transitions, as well as like tin, lead, arsenic, and so forth. How do you know whether they go to their higher or their lower? Well, if you memorize this phrase, as, Stan, or as Snoopy fell, huge cups cracked. Arsenic, if you look at the periodic table, can be plus 3 or plus 5 depending on whether it loses its P or S electrons. And what this phrase says, hey, that would be P and S, pick the plus 5. For tin, tin can be plus 2 or plus 4. Pick the plus 4. Iron, you pretty much have to memorize, would be plus 3 as opposed to plus 2. Copper would be plus 2 as opposed to plus 1 and so forth. So, you know, reference back to your atom unit and you'll see those common oxidation numbers. These all pick their higher. Now, an activity series talks about how reactive certain metals are. And if you need, this is not something you memorize. If you need an activity series, it would be given in some form or another. I think what's a little more important, I'll show you an activity series in a minute. I don't want to give away this answer because I want you to be able to interpret data. So let's say we did an experiment and in fact throughout the year you will do all of these reactions in some form or another. So let's take a look at the results of these and based on that which is the most reactive metals. Now reactive metals want to go from their solid to forming cations plus some number of electrons. So that's how we know it's reactive. They want to become the cation. They want to remain in the cation form. So let's look at what we have. If I have a copper penny, that means I have solid copper, at least on the outside of it. It may not be pure copper, depending on the year. And when we react it, this is what this first reaction says, we get an orange-brown kind of gas, a toxic gas. This is one we do in the hood. But the key is that because a gas formed, there was a color change, and a metal disappeared, that's pretty obvious that a reaction does occur. All right? 
Now notice that when we put copper solid in HCl, there's no reaction. So you want to try to find a way to get these words into symbolic form. Now, the next one is calcium. So let's take a look at what calcium does. The information tells us that when calcium is added to water, gas bubbles form, so we know that a reaction occurs. So reaction, no reaction. We know that a reaction occurs. Uh, honestly, if we put litmus paper in it, the litmus paper would turn blue. Remember, blue indicates a base. And I'm not going to predict these. All I'm after is showing you that the experimental evidence shows us that there's a chemical reaction. Now, a lit splint indicates if it a popping like a pop, like a a chihuahua barking, if that happens, that's evidence we made hydrogen gas. So we have clear evidence of a chemical reaction there, and that's with water. Now if we take zinc and react zinc with hydrochloric acid, a reaction occurs. A hydrogen gas is collected. In other words, you'd hear that little popping sound. When mossy zinc is added to water, no reaction occurs. Okay, Now, that's the information that's given. It's sort of like one of those logic puzzles. I don't know if you like to do those. I really enjoy those logic puzzles like in the Dell Puzzle books. I would add another piece of knowledge that you should have. Don't you notice that it showed calcium in water and zinc in water? But what about copper in water? The information told us nothing about that. Well, I, I hope you would know that common knowledge is, is that pennies get wet and they don't chemically react. So that would not be a chemical reaction. So let's now rank these according to reactivity. Well, look at calcium reacts in water. To react in water means it's very, very active. Notice it said from least active to most. So the most active would be calcium because it reacts in water. Now, what about between zinc and copper? Now, nitric acid and hydrochloric acid are very strong acids. But nitric acid is not only a strong acid, it loves to rip electrons off of things. We call nitric acid a strong oxidizing agent. Now, since zinc react with HCl and copper didn't, I would argue that zinc is more active than copper. Copper required an, not just a strong, oops, got a little carried away there, not just a strong acid, but a highly reactive acid. So that would put copper down at the bottom. So now let's look at an oxid, uh, excuse me, an activity series. Let's take a look at that and see if it agrees with our results. Whoa, I should have made that much bigger. I'm glad that you have that in your notes. Sorry about that. Um, what this activity series shows us is that the elements at the top, the top five elements, our most reactive will react with water. All elements above hydrogen on this series, this is showing us I, I hope you remember and let me bring it back into your mind if you don't. Half reactions, it's simply showing the oxidation reaction of the metal. And, and it's, we, we know it's an oxidation because electrons are a product. Remember, oxidation is loss. So our electrons are a product. Um, everything above hydrogen will react with acids typically and simple acids like HCl. All right. So we decided that copper was less reactive than zinc which is less reactive than calcium. 
Now there's one more factor that we want to see here is on an activity series, anything that is above is more reactive and we're going to see will replace those below. So calcium is above zinc, which is above copper. Gold is not very reactive at all. And that gives us an idea of chemical reactions that would occur. So let me tell you what that means in terms of the above being more reactive and replacing. If I put solid zinc into a solution of copper 2 plus, all right, Solid zinc right now, solids are zero oxidation number, ions are their ionic charge. Z zinc is going to give its electrons to copper, and I'll end up with zinc 2 plus plus solid copper. So now the copper is zero and the zinc is plus two. So you see electrons were exchanged, making it a redox. And if this happens spontaneously, we know that zinc is more active than copper. Okay, we're going to do some more examples of these in our next video on single replacement. So until then, this is signing off.